Web-Friendly Web. Warum unser Web nachhaltiger werden muss und wie wir das anstellen. Und euer Referent ist der Niklas. Er gibt euch einen kurzen Einstieg ins Thema Klimawandel und welche Beziehungen zum Netz da bestehen und wie die sich ergeben. Ein großer Applaus bitte für Niklas. Dankeschön. Warm round of applause for Niklas. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks that I can be here. So today we're talking about the planet-friendly web. Which effects does the internet have on the environment? And how can we change them and how can we minimize them? But how c b before we start, we have to uh, talk about this. This is a picture by Professor Julia Steinberger. And um, with this illustration, she tried to explain to four to eight year olds what climate change really means what greenhouse gases really do and it was really interesting to me how easy it can be portrayed so in principle it is like this we have an atmosphere around our earth which also makes sure that our earth uh, does not get um, obliterated by the sun but um, also keeps us warm but the more greenhouse gases we emit the more foil we wrap around our earth and the more rays can get in and the less, b much less can get out. Uh, so our earth gets harder. This means that as our earth gets harder, the water circle will change. Um, even more water will become part of the atmosphere. The issue is that this will create things like this. Studies have shown that the climate change will not only increase the number of climate catastrophes like hurricanes, but also increase the intensity of these catastrophes. So a warmer atmosphere and more water in the atmosphere, hurricanes will get worse. So we will feel this, for example, with Hurricane Dorian in the United States of America. So a show of hands, who has seen this before? These are the climate strides. Oh, a bunch of people, that's nice. For those who haven't seen it before, this is the visu visualization of the last 100 years. What you can see is 100 stripes. Each stripe represents one year and shows the average temperature in this year. The more red the stripe is, the warmer that year was on average. And you can clearly see this is the climate stripes version for Germany and you can see the last 100 years and in the last quarter the average temperature has risen significantly. So if we're talking about the climate crisis, we're not only talking about the Philippines or other countries which are far away, but we are also affected by this right here. So talk to the forest keepers, they are already noticing the effects in their everyday life. And we, in our everyday life, or the most of us, they are aware of this. They try to act sustainably by, for example, purchasing organic products. They're not buying coal energy. they might uh, ship parcels climate neutrally. So these are things that we do actively in our everyday life because the environment is important to us, but not in our professional life. So this most often doesn't go beyond, please think of the environment before printing this email. Most of you have probably seen this before at uh, uh, in some email from some company. For many, this is the only connection between environmental protection and their professional life. Who of you has seen this on a website before? Show of hands. So, less hands here. So, in signatures, we can see text like uh, I've shown previously quite often, but this here is uh, not so common. A radical example of a website that does it differently is the Low Tech Magazine. I don't know who of you knows this, but you can see this yellow area here. The yellow area shows 
How much battery the server has left? The server is only powered through solar energy. At uh, collected at some balcony in Barcelona, there's a little Raspberry Pi there with a solar panel attached to it. And if the sun is not shining for uh, a duration that's uh, too long, then this will be reflected here on the website. In the footer, you can see some uptime statistics. Two weeks are left if the battery is depleting. Uh, for example, if the sun isn't shining enough or too many people are reaching out to load this website. Uh, we often talk about flying less because flights are very uh, harmful to the environment. There's 830 million tons of carbon dioxide caused by the flight industry globally. But the thing we talk and think about less is the internet, which emits roughly the same amount of carbon dioxide. It's said that until 2020, um, the internet is going to emit twice as much as flights. But we never talk about this. We never talk about uh, changing our streaming act uh, behavior. We never talk about if we really, really need that website with the big pictures, but we mostly talk about flights. And this is what I'm trying to change with my talk today, because we need to keep in mind that the internet is made up of data. Data is essentially electrical impulses and those need energy. And energy production causes greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide specifically. This is a very simple formula we need to keep in mind when we uh, code websites or develop digital products. Data is energy is carbon dioxide. I think most of you are aware of how the internet works. But not so long ago, when uh, advertising was printing flyers or magazines were printed, this was a difference. Back then, we had the printing process, which used resources once. Then we had to distribute that, and that was transport paper, etc. Then it doesn't matter how many people read this newspaper or how long it stays in our cupboard, it doesn't use any additional resources. It's different with digital products. Digital products use uh, the most energy when they're being used intensively. For example, because packets are being sent to the DNS server, to the web server, and then they're getting sent back. All this uses energy. And the more people use a product, the more energy is used and is needed. What we need more of is cool people who think about making our products more sustainable. We often have people who really, really think hard about how the economic sustainability. We also have people who are concerned with um, the search engine ranking of the page. We have people thinking about, at best, uh, the accessibility of the page, but which we don't have today are professional people who are concerned with the sustainability of a site or how it might be designed more energy efficiently. Uh, so which features might need less energy than others? We need more of this. And in the next 30 minutes, you are going to get a crash course about this professional. I've distributed this talk into three parts. First part is about energy, which energy is used to run my page. Then there's about the resources I send. And then finally, we're about uh, the responsibility towards our users. Before uh, we start with that, let me introduce myself. I'm Nicholas Jordan. I'm from Schwerin. And I'm very concerned with the influence of technology on the environment and on people and the positive impact that can be made here. Let's start with energy. Energy is the most simple topic. Facebook started very early uh, by switching their, their data centers to uh, renewable energy. Then Google, Rockspace, and Salesforce 
joined them, but there's still products and companies who refuse that or aren't very transparent like that. Twitter doesn't publish any transparency uh, reports which energy they use to run the data centers. It is estimated that the uh, energy they use is about 35% renewable and we need to change that. It's rather easy to see if a site uses renewable energy or not. There's the Green Web Foundation. If you call up the website, you see this screen. You can enter the domain there and then you get results on whether they use renewable energy or not. Also, uh, if you run a website yourself, then you can access a registry of green hosters. So if you realize your hoster doesn't re use renewable energy, um, you can see who to switch to, who uses renewable energies and move your website. If you've done that, then you've already achieved a lot. So now we talk about the resources. Which resources do I send over the wire? So there's a really cool tool which helps us estimate how far I've already come. It's called Carbon Calculator. So I've done this for Wikipedia here. So you can just enter a domain and then you get a little report. So Wikipedia emits about 0 0.22 grams of CO2 per visit. They use sustainable energy, that's nice. But And then if you enter the correct number of page views, then you get a calculation of how much CO2 is really being used up or uh, created by this website. And you get some comparison values. The issue that we have is that we have faster and faster bandwidth, so we don't really have to care anymore about the size of a website. This graph shows how the average size of a website has changed over the years. Uh, right now we are at 3.5 megabytes as the size of an average website. 2011, this looked much different. So if we look at the yellow area here, that's the HTML part of the website. That's the stuff that is actually relevant because it's the content. And that part is actually getting smaller instead of larger. So we have less content on our website. We want to say less, but our website is getting bigger. And that's because we are using more and more images, even more high resolution pictures, more videos, and that's really not necessary because we don't have anything additional to say. Why should we increase the size of our website? A different aspect of this is advertisement. This is a graphic created by the New York Times and it shows in yellow which part of the size of a website is uh, actually advertisement on news website and which part is the content that's uh, the blue part and you can see the absolute mismatch you want to read an article but first you have to load 15 megabytes of tracking scripts and all that sort of stuff before i can actually see the content that is only four megabytes in size so there's definitely potential to optimize this the large advertisement corporations like apple google and co they're trying to change this a little bit at the moment there's just a huge mismatch. So not only is it important because of privacy and security to use ad blockers, but also from an ecological perspective. This is an example. It's webspeed.net and you can enter an URL and see how much energy I could save with an ad blocker, how many requests to just be able to evaluate how much is using an ad blocker really worth. 
Then there's also this nice tool for all of you who are programming websites themselves. This is really interesting. It's called the Performance Budget Calculator. Is any of you using, during the creation of websites, a performance budget? One to three hands are shown. Nice. So this is about defining that my website will load on an edge network within five seconds, for example. So that's my budget that I have uh, that I can translate to resources. So if I enter my goal here and the type of connection and then uh, how much time it should take to load this website, then I get an approximation of how much data I can put on my website, how much space I have for HTML, CSS, etc. And the advantage is that I have to really think about what I should put on my website and what I should not put on it. And this is really cool if you define this goal and then the customer wishes for a new feature and then you can talk to the customer about it and you can then say, we can do this, but then we will miss our performance budget or we have to remove something else. So then you have a concrete measurement with this tool uh, to work with. So I have an example here that I brought with me. F two years ago I was uh, using a large German publisher with four letters as an example but they didn't find it so cool and they asked me nicely to please stop using them as an example so now I'm using Wikipedia who are much cooler. So I did some napkin math so there are, of course, many more aspects, but I just wanted to show you the dimension of what we're talking about here if we change something. So I looked at the front page of Wikipedia. So what is loading each time I look at Wikipedia? And that's, of course, the logo. The logo, I downloaded this on my computer, and I checked the size, 45 kilobytes. Doesn't sound so large, sounds small. And then I checked uh, this image with Image Optim. It's fr it's a free tool for Mac, but there's also others. And uh, it uh, compressed the image for me losslessly. And you can see here uh, a saving of 56.5% um, that you could achieve s to end up with about 20 kilobytes. Wikipedia has 170 million page views per month multiplied by the saving, 25 kp, and re remove some caching, then you end up with 4,300 gigabytes of traffic that you could potentially save with this. According to the Federal Environmental Office, we need about 5,000 watt-hours of energy to send a gigabyte of data. If I put this into my calculation now, then I end up with 15,000 thousand watt hours of energy that I could save with this measures. Uh, that's about 10 single households of energy usage. So pretty big numbers we're talking about here. That's about 7 tons of CO2 emissions that we could save each month with this measure. So how much is 7 tons actually? With 7 tons of CO2 budget, you could fly from Hamburg to London 16 times return. So that's really a large amount of CO2 that we are saving by compressing this logo, which only takes about 2 minutes. But this is of course not the only thing you could do. Videos are a huge part of the global data transmissions. About 60% of the worldwide data transmissions are video. So video on demand is 34%, 13% alone are just Netflix. That's a big number. Pornography with 27% is a big topic as well. So maybe you can think about that this evening. To keep this in mind, there is a nice tool also made by the Green Web Foundation uh, co-developed by Chris Adams. Everybody of you probably knows Lighthouse if you're into web development to test your website 
uh, on different parameters. And what this foundation has developed is called Greenhouse. And additionally, to the others, other factors that Google is uh, looking at anyway, uh, we also now calculate a sustainability score so that you can automatically test your website on sustainability. But also Apple has now a feature in its Safari browser, they added a feature that allows you to check the energy consumption of a website visit to calculate this or to measure this. But not only what happens on the page is important for the sustainability, but also which language I use to program my website. So for example, if I look at the left column here, C has the least, uh, has the best energy efficiency uh, two years ago. Python has one of the highest. So this is also something to keep in mind uh, when you're programming apps and uh, what is the goal of that app and which language you should use. I'm a huge fan of text-only websites. For example, here you see NPR, the National Public Radio from the States. They have a text-only website, but also CNN, for example, has one. And I thought to myself, I don't earn my money with uh, creating websites with the best design, but uh, I should try also doing this with my own website, and that's what I did. I used only HTML, and I and I really want to give this uh, to you um, as a homework assignment. Please try to reduce things, and if you if it is not noticeable, then you can explain what is uh, going on. For example, I did this. I did that. I put my website looks broken to you. Read why, uh, so that people can understand why my website looks like this. And then also link to my old website, which had a very very uh, complex design. Um, but this, of course, saves a lot of bandwidth. Just to create some attention um, that. A website is not only professional when it has an amazing design, but also when it is sustainable. CNN. Uh, <coughs> by the way, they didn't start their text-only website for ecological reasons, but when Hurricane Irma hit uh, New Orleans and the mobile network was pretty much down, so they launched this site because it was the only source of information that people still had and could access. So it's there's also this aspect. Now I have the green um, user experience checklist from Man Overboard, which um, summarizes what you can do. Reduce images, optimize videos. You could also uh, deactivate autoplay, use less different fonts, etc. I think uh, you all know how to save data. One thing I want to send you home with is that the best design decision often is a simple no. So if you're arguing ab about whether a thing is necessary or not, maybe just decide not to. Now, the last part of my talk, responsibility towards the user. It's important to ensure that the user can avoid m most unnecessary clicks. I've heard that there are um, people who use SEO to get to their sites, even if they don't have the information people look for. So people come to their sites, don't find the information, and jump back and look for a new size source. So this is unnecessarily unnecessary data traffic. This We don't need this. A clear navigational structure and clear communication helps a lot. And the content should be accessible to everyone. The problem is that idealistic arguments in communication with the customer, they don't help much. This is why we need a business case for this. The business case has come from Amazon and the Stanford University. They conducted a study and found out that um, 
Amazon made more money with every second uh, loading time they cut in their site. So this is a very concrete business case on why you should optimize your page. But you can also win new users, as we can see at with CNN Lite. We improve user experience, sites load faster, we uh, spare the data volume of our users, we can um, save money in hosting, especially with big sites. There's a huge impact. And this also has an impact for search engines. So what now? Everybody who um, feels obliged to the web standards should keep this in mind in their future work. Uh, the W3C has laid this down in the ethical web principles that the web should be a sustainable platform. Also, there's a great community, uh, climateaction.tech. It's a Slack community, there's a forum, and some other features that are planned where we can exchange opinions, where you can ask questions if you're new. We're all very, very helpful, and it's a very nice community. You're cordially invited to join us. If you're more into hardware, there's also a community for you. There's impact makers. I can really recommend them. Really recommend to join them. There's also Tim Frick. Uh, thanks for some of the graphics. He wrote Designing for Sustainability. It's mostly about web design and websites and web development. And what can I personally do to make my sites more sustainable? And if you're more into the technical side of things, and wants to go more in depth here. Chris Adams gave a talk yesterday about server load and how to balance that. So check that out, I can really recommend it. If you're developing software, there's the Blue Angel next year, and I develop was in the developing of that, where you can get certified as a software product if you're very efficient. This is not just data transmission, this is also um, about um, downward comp compatibility so that you can also access this with old tech and you don't need to buy new hardware with every um, reiteration. This starts next year and I'd be very happy if you'd uh, join here. And I hope all of you are these awesome people now who are going to keep in mind the sustainability of features next time you develop a website and that you're going to be to uh, work toward make your making your sites more sustainable i'd like to end with captain planet go planet everybody do what you can and also um, if you're training new people professionally academically that you put this subject on the agenda because this is very, very underrepresented here. Take it with you, pass it on to your trainees, to your students, and put it on uh, the curriculum. Thank you for your attention, and you're going to find all the resources and my slides under this link. And now I'll take questions. This is your applause, thank you. Niklas, thank you so much. I didn't know that it is relevant which programming language you use. Learn something new again. So we have some time for questions. If you have a question, the microphones are all over the room. Just go to one of them and I will hopefully see you. So let's start with micro number one. Thank you so much. So. What about more complex algorithms to comp uh, compress data and then transfer them and then decompress them? So what's more efficient? Is a smaller file size but more computational power? To be honest, I cannot really answer that because you would have to calculate this on a case-by-case -case basis. So on the general basis, I cannot answer that. I'm sorry. Thank you. But maybe that's an idea that somebody could look at. Number two, please. 
Hello, my question is in the middle. There was a rough approximation per request that uh, it's about this and that CO2. Uh, so the difference between static websites and PHP scripts and all of that with database and so on, what's at the backend level, that all fell under the table. Is there uh, perhaps uh, some more detailed uh, view at this, a comparison between static websites and, for example, WordPress. Yeah, this definitely exists. I can uh, definitely uh, put some resources for that uh, to the link collection uh, behind the link that you can see here. You're definitely right that in this calculation, this definitely fell under the table. I really wanted to break this down as much as possible just to give a rough approximation. Thank you. Number four, please. There is also somebody. Hello. Thank you for the talk. My question. In my company, uh, if you're not so important, for example, as a working student, then it's really difficult to get these topics uh, escalated to the important people. What are some best practices um, that you could uh, do to uh, get this uh, through the different levels of hierarchy in my company. Oh, sorry, I didn't really understand. So once again, so if you're not so important uh, at this company uh, and uh, you want to make this topic known, what are some ways to get this known and actually establish this at uh, your company? That's a good question. So uh, get on the nerves of uh, these people. That is probably the most efficient I mean, you can probably also just calculate a lot of things uh, based on your concrete product. So, uh, for example, look at it and say, so if we do this and that, this will be the result. We had one customer um, where they're running a large cinema uh, franchise and and now we've reduced the resolution of the trailers and that allowed us to decrease the hosting costs significantly. So that's just an example of what you would have to calculate on a concrete basis. What could I do? And then just forward this calculation to the responsible. And otherwise, just uh, try to get as many colleagues as possible on your side. And you don't always have to start at the very top. You don't have to start at the CEO or um, the department leader. But you can also just uh, in your everyday work, you can just uh, implement this. That, for example, and if they're not agreeing, then maybe you can escalate it to the next level and see what they think about it. Uh, so that at some point it might become part of the workflow. And definitely try to get colleagues on board. Uh, so start small and then fight until the top. So that's a job for company forensics. Number five and number two. And then we also have internet questions. So now first, number five, please. Thank you. At our enterprise, the issue is that we often deal with companies who um, often don't take into account the um, a jump off rates. A, l a little bit louder, please. I don't. Was nothing heard? Everything's okay. So, the question that I am asking is do you have other tips how to make large corporations aware that this is actually important? Well, that really depends on your company that you're talking about. There are some large corporations that that do their own buckhams where you can potentially put that topic into place i can't really say it's it's always difficult um as a large company to just go to the highest uh level of hierarchy and say oh yeah i have an idea here i want to talk to you about this so then you just have to see what are the possibilities at your company and uh, how you could proceed with this and if anything else i'm always a big friend of just starting small and then fighting 
until you succeed. So if you have concrete examples uh, which you can bring forward, then it's often easier to convince the leadership of the company to actually pull through this. So, the young man at number two, please. Thank you for waiting. Thank you for the talk. Uh, regarding the ad blockers, I have a question. So, there are some mm, publishers like Spiegel Online or uh, the Standard of Austria, uh, which say if you are using an ad blocker, then uh, you cannot view our website. Is there a strategy against this or a good argument against this? So my strategy for this is to pay for content that I consume a lot. So I understand that the publishers want to earn money with their content. And they should. Journalism is costs money. That's no question. And the websites that I often look at, that I consume a lot, for those I pay, simply. And besides... There's only uh, the strategy of disabling the ad blocker for this particular page. Thank you. One and a half minutes. Maybe one more question from the internet. Dear Signal Angel. Yeah, you talked about the Blue Angel and that you're part of this. Can you talk a bit more about uh, that and what are the criteria? You said you're involved with this. So I was involved with this in different expert rounds. We met at the federal... Office for Environment and uh, different universities were also involved and together we worked on this. We discussed, criticized and changed and in general this is just a certification that you can apply for as a software product and right now that's only applicable for native software that you install on your computer. Um, so apps or other things are not relevant as of now but they're working on this. The principle behind this is that either you succeed in all the criteria or if you don't, you just don't get the Blue Angel. So an example for this is that you are uh, as energy efficient as possible and that your software runs on all the hardware so that you can use them for longer and um, maybe that you can give a guarantee that a guarantee a guarantee that hardware from the last five to ten years is compatible for example so it's a very long catalog and who is interested can write an email to my address and then i can also perhaps send you this uh, in advance great so thank you so much maybe a small or a large round of applause <laughs>